we now turn to Agnieszka Matejczuk, the chief expert on the Ombudsman for Children office. Ms. Matejczuk will cover another global pressing concern, children's rights uh, in vul vulnerable situations, yes. refugees. Ms. Matejczuk, you can proceed and join me here uh, and to if I can stay your here, speech. Yeah. As you wish. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hello. Hi. Uh, so, yes, my name is Agnieszka Matejczuk. I'm uh, from the Ombudsman uh, for Children's Rights Office in Poland. And first of all, thank you very much for, for the invitation. On the behalf of, uh, of the Ombudsman and for organizing this event, we were very happy to hear that you consider this topic, uh, the topic of children in vulnerable situation, refugees, an important one and one worth discussing in event focusing on advocacy. Um, because I imagine, um, as I understand this event, is directed to young people, young professionals, uh, who are still thinking about which issue, uh, which subject to get involved with uh, in, the, in the dedicated field. Uh, so I understand my role here as advocating for uh, rights of uh, migrant children as a work subject. Uh, to advocate for, to investigate, to research, um, and to build uh, the system, because I know you are from the different countries, but my experience in the subject is that what made me most interested in it was that I see that in Poland we are at the start, of the, at the beginning of um, the migrant children being, not a problem, I don't want to use that word, but being in need of, of uh, comprehensive care and that we just started to notice this problem in Poland because for many years it was invisible. The numbers were so small that we didn't need to worry. We could um, solve every individual issue um, basically, you know, with a little bit of creativity of workers from NGOs and people from administration. But now when the numbers grow, we see the need for uh, systematic solutions. And so that's why I'm really, really happy that uh, these problems that I can discuss with you here. Um, I think it's with no doubt the numbers will grow, to put it simply. And in Poland, uh, the last three years since basically since August 2021, when the crisis at the Belarusian border started, and then since February 2022, when uh, since inv uh, Russian invasion on Ukraine, uh, it became clear that this phenomena of migration is not something that we can watch from distance uh, in countries like Greece or Italy, but something that we really need to um, accommodate in, in Poland. And again, I use the word phenomena because say, talking about migration as a problem suggests that it can be solved in a sense of getting rid of it. And I don't believe that it's true. I believe that it is a phenomena that was always with us and will be with us. And it brings a lot of problems with it, as well as it brings a lot of uh, positive factors on the society. So the question is, how will we accommodate this phenomena so we can take the uh, good factors out of it and as much as we can avoid the, the negative ones. Um, so, yeah, so therefore I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's not really a question of solving the problem. Uh, it's, it is a question of building a system that can appropriately answer uh, this problem. And we, uh, in the Ombudsman office, I have to admit I'm there uh, since actually a few months. Um, most of my professional experience was in uh, non-governmental organizations on the ground with migrants, with children. Uh, I work as a lawyer. Um, therefore, I will, I will try to walk with you through the challenges of migrant children via the lens of their rights. So from the start, from the beginning when they come to Poland, when they come to, to a country of the refuge, to the end, what challenges they might um, encounter and how these challenges put in risk their rights. And I think it's really interesting to see how the rights create some sort of protective nests so that if we really take care of preserving them, we can shelter the, the children. I mean, it's, it's kind of obvious, but it's really interesting for me that 
uh, they are really, there can be really successful tool, the rights to name the specific challenges, to address um, address the specific uh, specific challenges. And I was happy to see when I started the work at Ombudsman Office uh, for Children's Rights that um, our current Ombudsman paired with you, uh, UNICEF, um, that they signed an agreement in April this year to strengthen uh, the policies uh, to protect migrant children and also to jointly monitor uh, the implementation of, uh, of the Children's Rights uh, Convention. So, yes, I will, uh, I will proceed. Um, just, um, I would like to clarify a little bit on terminology because um, we say refugee and commonly we use it as a term for all the migrants that are subject to forced migration. So all the migrants or the people that run away from the country because of circumstances um, that they cannot influence, independent from them. But legally, um, we use refugee in a sense of definition provided in Geneva Convention on the refugee status, which is very narrow. So legally, a refugee is a person who ran away from the country because of the risk of prosecution for very specific reasons. So prosecution because of the religion, political views, nationality, or a membership in a particular social group. And this is a closed catalog, okay? So I will use the refugee in a term that is commonly used because I think it's, it, it will be more understandable for all of us today. Uh, but maybe it's important to keep in mind that legally this term is much more uh, narrow. One more uh, clarification. I, I think I, I feel like I have to have to do it to be to be correct and precise um, in my in my speech today. That uh, I will talk about international protection procedure, which is something that we commonly name as asylum procedure, which legally is is not the same, but it's a procedure created for those who run away from. Uh, from both for refugees and more broadly for forced migrants. So also for those who run away from war, not only prosecution, but war or infri infringement of very, very serious infringement of human rights for more different reasons, okay? So not specified reasons like religion or political views, but um, different regions. And I think to understand fully, to comprehend the situation of, uh, of migrant children, we have to understand where they are coming from and what they are coming to, okay? And also before that, I, when I saw the subject uh, that I'm supposed to talk about, I thought there is two vulnerabilities here, right? So first of all, children in general are the vulnerable ones and it's worth thinking about why. So they are dependent on their care caretakers. They have still limited access, limited um, capacity to comprehend the world around them. They need support to really understand what's going on, to really un to really make decisions, appropriate decisions, uh, and also very importantly for our subject today, they are easy to influence. So, and the influence that they experience at this stage on the, of the life and what they go through will have um, effects on their whole uh, future. So, these are the reasons why children in general are vulnerable, okay? And then the refugees as a separate group are vulnerable, why? Uh, so the vulnerability starts in the country, if we talk about refugees, so forced migrants, um, because they usually run away from danger or kinds of danger. It can be war, it can be political prosecution, more broadly, it can be famine and other social crises. Uh, then they are vulnerable on the road, um, often they are desperate to get into the destination, so they are ready to, to get themselves in a very dangerous situation to do that. Um, and this situation may include uh, natural um, danger, so like in forest in Poland when it's winter, or at the sea next to Greece or, uh, or Italy, but also they are much more prone to be victims of abuse and violence uh, from other actors. So this, this is basically the context of where these children are coming from, okay? So they're coming from, I would say, double vulnerability, okay? And where they're coming to, uh, and this is, um, I have to specify that it's impossible in Polish context to talk about it between distinguishing between two groups, without distinguishing between two groups. And one group is refugees from Ukraine, their situation is completely different and unprecedented. 
and other refugees, specifically uh, refugees that are coming to Poland via Belarusian uh, border. I don't know how much you know about the subject. I will be happy to, to answer the questions uh, after all. Um, so Ukrainian uh, children that come in from Ukraine since 2022, they come to Poland and immediately they stay in Poland is legal. They do not even have to go through any specific administration procedure because the temporary protection embraces them automatically. If they come after, 2020, uh, after 24 February 2022, they come due to war, um, they are already embraced. So they stay here is legal. So this first challenge that other migrant children may uh, encounter is already um, avoided, okay, which is Great, it's, it's amazing that we're able to, to do it in, in the whole European Union uh, and unprecedented, as I, uh, as I said. It looks differently for children in, uh, that are coming through Belarusian border. I would say it looks completely opposite. So when they arrive uh, to Poland, they are considered from the start to be irregular, to be illegal, illegal, I, I hate that word, but this is the truth, and they stay is, is unregulated. So the first right that is at risk for those children is the right to asylum and is the right to uh, protection against all forms of violence. Those are two rights that are included in the convention that, in my opinion, are the first ones that are uh, in danger. Uh, for those for those children, why protection against violence? And I have to say, when I was preparing to, to talk to you today, I thought this protection against violence is something that is moving along throughout the whole uh, process. Um, first of all, violence in their own country, but also violence in Belarus from the side of Belarusian uh, border guards. Um, so if they are commonly said, pushed back to, um, to Belarus, they can face, first of all, violence from the uh, Belarusian soldiers, but then they can face deportation to the country without an investigation of their individual situation. So without investigation, if there is a danger um, in their country. So that's the first right, first challenge. And if we have time, I would like to, because this is more complicated issue, but if we have time, I can talk about how the right to asylum can be also a challenge. Uh, for Ukrainian children, uh, but I'm, I'm saying it out loud to remember. Um, so this is the, the first one. And then what happens if the child is successful uh, in um, when they encounter a border guard in the forest and they are successful in uh, declaring that they wish to stay in Poland, they are successful in declaring that they wish to apply for international protection. So then we have another issue of age assessment. And this is a huge issue because if age assessment is not done properly, then the um, child doesn't have obviously access to all the rest of its rights, to, so to proper care, to a representation. Uh, it can be pulled, uh, it can be put in um, in centers together with adults, which again, which again is um, the risk of, of abuse. And the age assessment is extremely problematic issue, especially uh, in Poland. So, legal European legal framework tells us that three things basically. Um, first of all, that the margin of error always have to be interpreted for the favor of the child. So if we, um, if we conduct the evaluation and then we still have some doubts about the age of the child, we should consider uh, the person minor. Secondly, that the process has to be conducted with the respect for dignity of the child and that the child should be informed properly. So informed in the way that it can understand uh, about all the consequences of the age assessment, okay? And here the law stops. Uh, and how it looks in Poland. In Poland, basically, we are doing, the border guards are doing x-rays of the wrist, of the ribs, sometimes teeth, uh, which we have very rich literature on, and also uh, guidelines from European Asylum Agency, from UNHCR, that this is not sufficient in any way. Uh, this way of age assessment does not um, consider um, our 
ethnic differences, sort of say. So basically, my ribs and ribs of children from and wrists children from Eastern European Union in age of 15 can look completely different from children coming from Asia, children coming from Africa, and this is not considered in that uh, in that assessment. And secondly. Uh, yeah, so this is basically not enough, okay? And there is a, lead, um, there is a methodology built uh, that includes psychological assessment, but also simply interviews with the child when we ask about the chronology of their life. And we can see if this is credible, if they are able to provide credible um, information about the life so far, obviously um, with, the, with the assistant of a, of a psychologist. And this is used in several countries. Um, for example, Italy is a good example, in my opinion, with the age assessment. It doesn't mean that there, there are no problems there, but they have this methodology put in place. In Poland, we don't have it. Sometimes we do not even have in the medical reports, there is no margin of error which is impossible because the margin is at least two years medically, okay? And then if we have a 16-year-old boy and the margin is two years, it's, yeah, I don't, I don't have to explain it, okay? So, um, and then the medical reports very often say not the age between 16 and 18, but this person is at least 18, that's it, okay? And the important thing to keep in mind is also that we have no legal way to undermine the outcome of the assessment. There is no possible way to appeal for the second assessment, for, the, so for some additional evaluation. We just have to accept that. We had once in uh, one situation when we were able to undermine the age assessment in the later process in the court, when we received uh, the copies of the um, child birth certificate from her uh, from her home country and miraculously called, took, in court, took into account her testimony and the copy, not the original, but the copy of the, of the document and decided that um, this girl was uh, in fact a minor. Um, so, that, so this is the second challenge, okay, that can, in, that can be a barrier for all the rest of the rights. Um, but let's say we were success, successful in both of those stages, okay? So we were able to access the territory, we were able to be considered as a child, what happens to us uh, afterwards? Um, and this can vary, but I think the, ch the biggest challenge at the next stage is the proper representation, okay? So in my opinion, and in, um, in, in general, in opinion of professionals, it's it's well said, and I will also like to explain you later on um, effects of that, that on the next stage, the most important thing is proper representation. So what I mean by that is a person who at the beginning of the child's road will sit down with a child and talk through all the stages. What's going to happen to you now? What are your options? How the procedure looks? And start, starts to build trust with the child. In that way, first of all, um, we are trying to build towards trust which will allow us to get to know the child, which will allow us to recognize the situation of the child and make a proper decision if the child is in need of protection, if we should search for parents and maybe return the child to the country. Um, without the trust of the child, we are not really able to find out and to properly assess the situation. Secondly, um, Poland is called transitioning country for, more, for most of the, the refugees, okay? But this is especially true for children. They usually, um, I guess I have some statistics, but the problem is that we are not able to have uh, very specific statistics on that. From the Office for Foreigners um, that is conducting the application process for international protection in Poland, we know that there were um, 292 applications made by unaccompanied minors, okay, uh, in 2023 in Poland. Probably this number is a bit too high uh, because they are not the best in um, collecting the data. And I think we, we talked with the, with the workers there that probably this data includes also children from, from the families who for various reasons had to make a separate application, okay, for international protection. Uh, so we don't know exactly um, how many children are in this situation, but from, from my experience, um, 
most of them don't wait until the end of the procedures, okay? And why is that? I think the big factor is the lack of proper representation. So there is no one who will sit down with them and say, this is what can happen for you here in Poland um, if you stay. And this is what are the these are the consequences if you go along, if you go illegally to other European countries. There is no situation like this. Uh, in other countries, um, the unaccompanied children, migrant children, they have someone called guardian, okay? Uh, it's organized differently. Sometimes it's a lawyer, sometimes it's a social worker. In Poland, we have this strange situation, and this is not true for Ukrainian children, uh, where we split the factual care and the legal care for migrant unaccompanied children. And the factual care comes to um, the, the, the person who will take care of the child in the foster facility, in the institution, and they have, have as much of the legal uh, representation as possible for the daily life of the child. So they have a right to sign up the child for school, to go to the doctor, etc. But when it comes to the procedures, like uh, protection procedure, legalization of stay, deportation procedure, for each procedure, there is a different representative appointed. And there is no base of professional procedures that have both soft and hard skills to do it. So both knowledge of the procedures, but also soft skills to work with the child. Uh, usually what happens is that um, the, the representative guardian is appointed uh, from attorneys in Poland. Uh, the bar associations are requested by court to appoint someone and they are completely not prepared to do it. Because first of all, most of law, I mean, this is a very specific branch of law, that's what I wanted to say, and if you don't practice it, I mean, it's not hard, but <laughs> you, you just don't know how the procedures looks and what is the most important in them. But second of all, and maybe more importantly, you don't have the soft skills to work with the child. And then in practice, the institution is limited to being there at the application moment and signing the documents, then being there at the interview moment, signing the documents, and that's it. And the child is left um, to itself with no knowledge what's going on and what will happen. What will happen. Um, and I think, and I know from my experience that this can influence uh, the outcome of the procedure. I myself was a guardian once, um, not once, but in this in this particular situation where. Uh, we worked with a translator, a volunteer translator who was in contact with the child all the time. And we could see where were the moments when child started to call someone more often, when they get stressed, when you could see that they are preparing to leave, okay? And we were able to organize um, systematic conversations, just regular conversations with the child to remind them what they are waiting for, to remind them that they, that they have big chances for asylum, that if they receive asylum in eight years, they can be a citizen of European Union and they will be able to go wherever they want. They will have their citizenship here, uh, passport. Um, and, and finally, we were able to, uh, after a year and a half, to receive a positive decision and this boy now uh, plays football in a very good um, in a very good team. Uh, so I think, but I also saw uh, the opposite examples. Okay, so I really believe that securing the child right to to proper representation is significant factor in basically stopping them from moving forward with their illegal migration. Uh, secondly, the right that is also connected to it is the right of the child to be heard. Because if I don't have a proper representative, obviously I cannot be heard properly in uh, the procedures that regards my, uh, my well-being, okay? Uh, just one thing, because you have a phone, could you remind me when it's a few minutes to finish because I didn't have the... Okay, thank you. Um, uh, and then the next right that I would like to talk about is probably not an issue in every European country, but it's certainly an issue in Poland. So um, deprivation of liberty, unlawful deprivation of liberty. So unfortunately in Poland there are still children in detention. And in 2023, um, according to border guard statistics, there were 161 children in detention, from which 37 were unaccompanied ones, okay? So um, 
taking a look at European Court of Human Rights judgments against Poland, <laughs> a few of them, uh, that said specifically that children shouldn't be put uh, in the detention. I mean, they can be put in detention as a last resort, but every time there has to be a proper uh, investigation in their best interest. And we can imagine that detention place is not a, um, detention center is not a place which is basically a, li a little bit better prison, um, prison with better conditions. Uh, you cannot properly heal from the trauma of a journey. That's the first one and a big big one, I would say. Access to education is very limited. Access to healthcare is very limited in detention centers. Uh, access to psychological support. And uh, so we know that detention has a determining um, factor, um, the mining factor for, for psychological well-being of the child. Oh, okay. Moving, moving very fast forward. Um, Mm -hmm. So I said about the prevention. Yes, and the last thing, the last right, I will say, uh, there, obviously you can talk a lot about education and integration, but I think these are the basis because we cannot talk about integration and education if we don't talk about these basic rights that count when the child enter, uh, enter Poland. Um, the, the last one is uh, right to private life and to identity, which is very true in Poland in regards to huge group of children who are in Poland in un undocumented families. So uh, those are most of the people come from Russia, from Chechnya, who are here in uh, very long lasting procedures. For many, many years, they try to acquire legal status and they and succeed. They are here, they're still, they stay here is undocumented. And um, so children come here when they are six, and when they are 14 and went through all the education in Poland, the deportation decision comes, okay? And, and here is um, the procedure that we are most often get involved in as ombudsman because we can argue, we can support the claim that the children should receive humanitarian stay on the basis of their integration, on the basis that their deportation should be, uh, will influence their psycho psychological development in a very significant way. Uh, and how, what, what do we do with it? What is our advocacy focusing on? Uh, so I, that was actually one of the arguments that I that convinced me to uh, to come to to work for the ombudsman office, because uh, we are preparing, and I, I, I mean it's mostly ready the project of the law that would allow for um, proper representation of children, and it's very simple. Actually, my boss uh, wrote it perfectly. I'm very uh, impressed with it because it's a very simple way to connect uh, the migrant child to the representation that we already have in family code. There is just some uh, obstacles on the way, some requirements that uh, we have to mi uh, exclude migrant children from in order to be able to set the proper representation for them. We are already prepared to educate um, candidates for, for the representatives established in that way, uh, to acquire them with knowledge and uh, both hard skills and soft skills to be able to do it. Um, we also um, do a lot of um, interventions on the on the border. Basically, we received a lot of uh, information on the ground, information from humanitarian workers when there is need um, to intervene. Uh, we are in contact with border guards to try to ensure that children are have access to their um, to the Polish territory that they can um, execute their right to uh, to asylum. Um, I had a lot more prepared, but I usually talk a lot, so I'm happy to answer your, your questions. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, nice talk and speech. Actually, I, I, I have a lot of questions when you talk, mm -hmm. because uh, there are a lot of problems, actually, yes. especially in regard uh, to children. Uh, one of the biggest problems I, I, I have noticed recently, actually for the recent few years, is the, the human trafficking and mm. uh, children trafficking, especially uh, the rise of 41% in the last uh, mm -hmm. 2022 to 2021. That's mm -hmm. a huge uh, uh, jump. 
and uh, do you recognize uh, in the obducement uh, the, um, this problem and to address it somehow? Because um, mm -hmm. uh, as I see it uh, in my work, we are really prepared and I, I'm, uh, you haven't been at the beginning, I'm, I'm an airline pilot. Uh, mm -hmm. So I see it happens that uh, even the, the, the case of couriering uh, children, small children from Europe to mm -hmm. distant countries. Do you have any um, procedures? Do you recognize mm -hmm. the problem? Yes, we certainly do recognize the problem. Actually, I think last week we were uh, giving our opinion regarding the national plan on um, human trafficking in Poland. So there is a plan put in place uh, to, um, it involves obviously obviously educate more uh, education for border guards, for all the institutions that might encounter the child that has been subject to, to trafficking. Um, I have to be honest, from my point of view, maybe I'm fixating on that, but the issues that I talked about, they are really connected to human trafficking and to, to child trafficking. Why? Because if we um, allow the child to run away from Poland basically very fast. So I know about the situations when the facilities, the foster facilities, they say straightforward that we know that sometimes came, someone came and, and pick up the child and we don't know who was it. Was it a family? Was it a trafficker? Probably very often it was a trafficker. And if there would be a, a person from the day one uh, to whom the child would have a trust, and be able to describe their story and who will listen to the child and investigate, be able to investigate, because the, at the beginning they are very closed off and they have their story prepared in mind. Someone told them what to say exactly when they encounter border guards. So if we will be able to, at the beginning, um, ensure that we really listen and really look, um, then maybe maybe we'll be able to pick up the clues faster, um, basically. So that's, um, yeah. Mm. That's that's my that's maybe my my answer. We are certainly uh, aware of that, and I have to also say that um, on this national plan, there was more work done in um, the criminal department, uh, the, the department dealing with criminal law, uh, in the ombudsman office. So they might be better uh, equipped to to answer. But we are certainly aware of that, and we are cooperating with um, authorities who prepared that that plan. That's right. So. Doesn't work now. <laughs> I would like to uh, ask uh, okay. one more question. Mm -hmm. Regarding, the, yeah, it's uh, it's a really important uh, thing you said. It doesn't work. No, no, it's okay. That's okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah. Well, well, because I had I had a situation. Mm -hmm. I had a um, supposed human trafficking on board. And uh, actually, what I noticed was lack of procedures. Actually, we have but the, the special forces and, and people who should verify these cases uh, didn't have that was my opinion as a captain of the, of the plane. Now, but the, what is coming to my mind uh, also, uh, as you say about the refugees, the Ukrainian children, they come to across the border, and uh, did you uh, have? Do you have any statistics? What is the rate of children human trafficking? No, you? I'm sorry. You don't, I'm... you don't follow this. No, I'm sorry. Me personally, no. I would be able. I can come back to you to you with that if you want to personally. Wow. But uh, really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I ha I would have one thing more to say because you said that the increase was on 21, 22. And I think Ukrainian situation has to have something to do with that because at the border there was a huge chaos. Okay, so um, we our response was very much from the bottom up. So a lot of people, not organizations, but just people by themselves, came to the border with hot tea, with coffee. Um, people who have no connection to any organization then just came with the cars and suggest to people, hey, we can drive you to to the nearest city. We can drive you to the refugee center. And obviously, it's very nice, but we know that amongst those people were traffickers. And uh, the situation like that, without no control in the border area, and where uh, hundreds of people daily came through border, were after border left by themselves and encountered a lot of people declaring 
that they are willing to help them. Yeah. I'm happy that you see the problem, you yeah. target the problem. I hope the procedures will, will come up. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I see Francisek, you would like to ask a question. So, uh, distinguished uh, speaker and my colleague from Warsaw Bar Association, uh, thank you very much because it was uh, excellent uh, speech. And uh, we mentioned uh, the element uh, that uh, um, the level of the United Nations and its rules of law mm -hmm. are at uh, very um, uh, abstractive and general. Yeah. And uh, I, and we and after that, the, the effect is is that we need to implement law in our countries. And I'm very very happy that you just presented the legal situation from the CEE perspective, not only Poland, but Ukraine and Belarus as well. And what I mean uh, by that, uh, this is uh, really our role to implement the law, to, to um, implement uh, specific uh, procedures and uh, and on this occasion, I must say that uh, I'm very happy about uh, the that uh, children's rights of its, uh, man, Mrs. Horna yes. uh, and UNICEF uh, signed an agreement to strengthen child protection in Poland. Uh, it was uh, strengthening the national system for child protection in Poland, especially in the context of unprecedented numbers of refugee children and jointly monitoring the implementation of uh, the Convention on the Rights of the Child in Poland. It was two, uh, April 23rd yeah. and uh, it was signed by, uh, as I said, a businessman for children of the Republic of Poland, Mrs. Monika horna Cieslak, and country coordinator of the UNICEF Refugee Response Office in Poland, Nona Sikerman. We're very happy about that. Once again, I want to thank uh, the Ebensman for children, Ms. Horna Cieslak, for having you as her um, official representative. We're very happy and we once again want to thank uh, Commissioner for Human Rights, Professor Marcin Piontek, as well as we have such prominent uh, institutions involved in our conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.